Hey kids, it's time to get some SML podcast all up in that. What's up, everyone? This is the SML Podcast. I am your host, Joe. Joining as usual, Cole, how are you doing? I didn't die between last week and this week, so I guess I'm okay. That's good. Yeah, I, I, mean, I came close. No, try not to die. I'm trying. I I don't <laughs> know harder. if it's I don't know if it's like a 24 hour bug or what, but last night I was just like I was up until 6 a.m. throwing up. It was uh you. I woke up this morning and the first thing I did was just dry heave. Because there was there was nothing left to throw up, so I've been there. Haven't eaten all day, so I am feeling fucking awesome. <laughs> Sounds like it. I'm jealous. <laughs> How's your week been? I mean, you want to hear funny? Sure. I was supposed to go on Tuesday to get an ultrasound, right? Okay. Um, my liver's fucked up, so <laughs> uh, just casually. Uh, anyway, I was supposed to go get an ultrasound done, and they were like, my my appointment was at 11 in the morning, and they're like, okay, but you can't eat after midnight. Okay. And I'm like, I fucking hate you, because then I spent all day Monday, like, literally trying to eat everything within a five-mile radius, because I knew I wasn't going to be able to eat on Tuesday. <laughs> and then I'm like, I got to, I, I wake up on on Tuesday morning, and like... Normally, I don't drink coffee or anything, so I, I drink a pop in the morning. That's where I get my caffeine jolt to function. <laughs> and and I woke up, and I'm like, I can't have a pop. I can't even have water. My mouth is dry. You can't even have water? I really? I couldn't even have water. Um, that I was, sucks. I couldn't take my medication. I was fucking miserable. So I was up for like... Closing in on two hours. 6.50 a.m. I'm like, I got this. I can survive. I'm fasting. We're good. 6.51 a.m. The phone rings. And it's the hospital. Oh, no. And, and she's like, hi, yeah, we can't do your ultrasound today because the ultrasound tech is out with the flu. You'll need to reschedule. Oh, uh, boy. And then you ate like crazy. 6.52 a.m. My ass was eating leftover pizza. <laughs> nice. Good fucking morning. <laughs> Good fucking morning indeed. <laughs> I wasted no time. <laughs> As you should. As you yep. should. So then you can hear me next week, bitch, about how on Monday I had to fast all over again <laughs> to go do my ultrasound this time, maybe. And uh, hope that, you know, the ultrasound tech is over the flu because I don't want to have to reschedule a gajillion more times. Yeah, that's never fun. That tells you how big our hospital is that they have one ultrasound tech. Yeah, you would think they'd have more than one, no. you know, as a backup <laughs> just in case. No. <laughs> Most of the hospitals around here can't even deliver babies. Really? The the three, four closest hospitals, two can deliver babies. The fuck do you do if you have to have a baby and you're you're one of the other hospitals? They put your ass in an ambulance and ship you to one of the others. Hold it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it's true. Just cross your legs. Don't let it squeeze out. Yeah. So I told David we can't have no more kids because the doctor that delivered all three of the girls, he went to one of the, he transferred to one of the hospitals that doesn't have a maternity ward. And I was oh like, boy. well, no more kids for us. <laughs> yeah, I like that doctor. So we're SOL. Oh, well. Yeah. What are you going to do? Not have more kids. I know <laughs> what we're going to do. We're going to talk about video games. Are we? Shocker, that, huh? That seems like a thing you should do if you had a video game podcast. Yeah, I might as well. I, I've been thinking about starting one up. Yeah? Yeah. You know, you've had some practice. <laughs> you'll do fine. I'm sure you'll Six have Six years one. of practice. This is episode one of the MLS podcast. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we'll have like 900 followers in no time. Oh, yeah. It's fine. I'm sure. Anyway, news. A lot of news happened this week. 
Uh, it finally happened, but EA Access is heading to the PS4. I am a little surprised by this and also not surprised by this. And why for each one? The biggest reason for being surprised, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, is because it made my voice crack. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest reason for being surprised is because of the reason that they gave when EA Access was first being launched they said oh no we don't think it's a good value for our customers now all of a sudden they're like yeah bring it on yeah now that xbox has had it for five years bring it on over yeah and i think the biggest reason for that is because they can't compete with game pass so they have to have something true and so it's ea access very true what is your reason for not being surprised because they can't compete with Game Pass and they had mm. to have something. <laughs> so, I mean, it was either get EA access or wait for fucking ever while they get the, the ball rolling to get their own. They, I mean, I know they have, what is it? PS, PS plus, isn't it? PlayStation now. Now, but it's not in any way comparable to Game Pass as far as like download the shit, play it as much as you want right now. I mean, you're allowed to download the PS4 games on PS now, but all the PS3 games on there are still just streaming. Stream. I thought I thought all the PS4 games were still streaming. No, they, they added download capability oh. for PS4 games. So they're kind of getting their shit together, but I still don't want to pay 20 bucks a month for it. It's $20 a month? Pretty sure. Either 15 or 20 And how many games are included? Oh, there's a few hundred. There's a lot of oh, games. Oh, okay. Yeah. They okay. have a huge library, but... A lot of them are PS3 games and a lot of them are streaming and it's just not as good. So it's $20. It has more games. It might be 15. I might be wrong. I want to say it's 20, but it might be 15. I can't remember off the top of my head because I'm not a subscriber. I'm going to err on the side that Game Pass is still better. Yeah. Like when you look at the pros and cons. Yeah, most people agree that play that uh, PlayStation Now is just not as good as Game Pass. Game Pass has its shit together, has 200 games, 10 bucks a month, everything you could download. I I prefer Game Pass. Even less than 10 bucks a month once the Xbox Live Pass Ultimate thing goes. Well, then it'll be 15 a month. But you yeah, get but gold then too. you'll get gold too. Yeah. And you'll still, PlayStation, you'd still have to pay for that separately. Yeah. So, still, yeah, still going to run the show. PS4 finally getting EA access. The The price is still going to be the same, 5 bucks a month, 30 bucks for a year. It's starting in July. My question is, what are they going to do uh, to make up for the fact that there's no backward compatibility on the PS4? So That you is a lot of games, too. All, like those, a- all those 360 games that we have in EA access are out of the question now. Right. They have to do something because, I mean, why would it be the same price if it's going to have a fraction of the the titles? I don't know. I mean, it's been the same price since the beginning, so it's not like the price went up as the content went up. So maybe they're just looking at it as you're paying five bucks for the service and whatever's there is there. Yeah. Deal with it. Man. I don't know, but uh, I guess we'll find out in a couple of months. Yeah. I'm curious to see how it pans out. Yeah. Uh, Some other news. Three games were added to the backward compatibility lineup this week on Xbox One. On Tuesday, we got Costume Quest and From Dust. And then on Thursday, we got the Hitman HD pack, which includes Hitman Contracts and Hitman 2 Silent Assassin HD. Oh, nice. Yeah. When I saw From Dust, I got excited until I remembered that that was not Dust and Elysian. Yeah, I know. (laughs) I thought the same thing. And I was like, shit. <laughs> I want to know how that went from being a Microsoft published title to only being on PS4 this generation. Is it? Yeah, it's on PS4. What kind of horse shit is that? I, I'm guessing that the contract ran up with Microsoft and they were allowed to publish elsewhere. But why not bring it to Xbox One and Switch as well? That's weird. Yeah. I don't understand why devs do like 73% of what they do. I don't get it either. I do not get it. But a good good additions to the backward compatibility lineup. I was worried that the program was like on its way out because we got one game in April. Yeah. And now we got two additions in one week. 
So maybe they just took a month off and. Well, the the biggest thing I remember when it come out and they were talking about how basically they have a small team there at Microsoft that tests and tests and tests mm-hmm. and tests. And like they won't let a game go until they are a, a million times sure that it's going to work. And then also they have to make sure any DLC or any updates or anything works for it too. Yeah. And um, then, you know, they also have to have go through and have all the approval of the, the developers and if there's any licensing issues before they can even work on it to see if they can make it work. So it's a small group that does it and they kind of have their hands full. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not particularly surprised when we go a stretch without any, cause that's, that's hard work. It really is. Mm-hmm. But it's good to see him back. And, uh, hopefully we, we get a nice lineup of, uh, additions from now on. Yeah. Cause it's, it's like some of the highlights of my week to see new games added. I'm Joe, weird like that. What? Y- you need a more exciting week. <laughs> I do need a more exciting week. <sighs> Preferably without a stomach virus. Yeah, that'd be good, too. (laughs) Uh, Also growing is the Nintendo Switch Online NES collection. They are getting three more games for May with Donkey Kong Jr., Clue Clue Land, and Versus Excite Bike. That will make over 40 NES games in the lineup when those hit on the 15th. Wow. Yeah, so it's growing. It is. I still wish that there was an actual real virtual console, but, you know, fucking... Stop Whatever. asking for too damn much. I know. <laughs> I know. I have high hopes and they're never met. Uh, speaking of the Switch, the original Devil May Cry is going to be releasing this summer on the Switch. Wow. It's interesting that they're only releasing the original Devil May Cry when every other platform has gotten the Devil May Cry trilogy. Yeah, that is. That's when you said the original Devil May Cry, I was like, all of them. <laughs> no, just the original and then Devil you May said Cry. Just the one, and I'm like, no two, oh, no three, okay. no DMC, no Devil May Cry four, no but Devil May Cry is five. The best. Just the original. I mean, if you were gonna pick any of them, then I'd say they should have just done three over all the others. But what you do gotta, I know? <laughs> you got to start at the beginning. My my <laughs> guess is they're going to release it, see how it does. I mean, and if it does well, they'll release fair. the others. To be fair, Devil May Cry 3 is a prequel, so it is the beginning. Eh, you nitpicking now. Yeah, but I'm honest. <laughs> I can't say I'm wrong. True. Okay, then. Carry on. <laughs> yeah, my, my guess is they're going to release it, see how it sells, and if it does well, they'll work on bringing the others over. But I, I guess it was just easier to get one game working than getting three working. Yeah. Should have just been the better one of the four, though. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, a new trailer was shown this week for the Final Fantasy VII Remake on PS4. Square says more details are coming in June, so maybe this thing is actually going to release this year. Is that That is PlayStation only, isn't it? Uh, so far, it's been announced as first on PS4. It hasn't been confirmed for anything else. Hmm. Because I know, I saw I watched the trailer for it, and David was like, if I can't get it on Xbox, I don't even want to. I don't even want to know that it's coming. I was yeah. like, okay. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> My I guess understand. is there'll be a year exclusive or two years exclusive, some kind of bullshit like that. But hopefully, yeah. hopefully it shows up on more platforms. You know, Xbox and Switch just got the original Final Fantasy VII. So fingers crossed we'll get the remake as well eventually. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I know David really likes Final Fantasy VII, says it's one of his favorites. I didn't ever play it. I don't remember shit about it. <laughs> I just know that that's the one with Cloud, and he has the dumb hair. And I was curious <laughs> to see how they did the dumb hair. Somebody, somebody is going to rip our comments open for that one. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it is pretty stupid hair. It's dumb hair. And so I was like, how are they going to make that work in today's graphics? And they did a, they did a fine job. It looks fine. Yeah, the fine. game looks, it looks beautiful. It looks like it's a more action-based uh, combat system than just turn-based. But I I don't know. We'll see. It it looks beautiful. Yeah, that's for it sure. really does. And the, the iffy thing with anything like that is always, for me anyway, how the 
the dialogue syncs up with the the face animation. Mm-hmm. And it it was a little awkward, but it was far better than I expected <laughs> at the same time for a trailer. I was like, eh, yeah, that's pretty good. That's okay. We'll see how it comes out in the end, but it's passing. Square usually does a good job with yeah. lip syncing, so I wouldn't be shocked if it turns out really well. Yeah. I have high hopes for it. I know a lot of people are excited about it and I wanna I wanna see it be a good one. I want it to see be like the Spyro remaster and just yeah. blow everybody's socks off and be what they remembered the game being. Well yeah, because this is a full remake, it's not a remaster. Well Spyro wasn't either. Yeah, that was a full remake. So I mean same concept, but I just chose the wrong word. It's fine, Joe. Damn right you did. <laughs> I'm not going to let that shit slip on my watch. <laughs> don't, start, don't start quality controlling me now. <laughs> it's too goddamn late for that shit. <laughs> uh, speaking of the PS4, Just Shapes and Beats Hardcore Edition is launching this week on the PS4 on the 10th. Uh, the blurb on the site said it launches first on PS4, so maybe the... The hardcore content will launch on the Switch eventually, and when asked, because I, of course, threw a threw a tweet up saying that I'm still hoping for an Xbox release, they confirmed that they are still working on it. So an Xbox oh. version is still in the works, just don't know when we're going to see it. Nice. Yeah, the all the times I played it at MAGFest, I played it with an Xbox controller, and then it launched first on the Switch, second on PS4, and us Xbox fans are still waiting on the goddamn game. I just don't understand that. I really don't. Oh, man. It felt so good on an Xbox controller, too. The game is so good. It doesn't matter what system you play it on. You have to play just shapes and beats. It's good. Hmm. It is indeed good shit, though. So, uh, it has been announced that Monster Hunter World is Capcom's best-selling game ever with over 12 million units shipped. I'm not even a little surprised. And it's getting its first big expansion this September, I believe. Talk about waiting a while, though. Yeah. Like, I know they've had a, a ton of updates and, and timed events and things like that, but for a legit DLC-type kind of edition, it's, uh, it's been a while. They're a little overdue. Yeah, I'm thinking that this is a situation where Capcom didn't know whether or not the game was going to do well, so they didn't have any kind of DLC in production yet. Yeah. And then they're like, well, let's see how it performs, and then we'll handle DLC from then. And then it blew up, and they're like, oh, shit, we should probably do something. <laughs> and now they're doing something. Took them long enough, but yeah, I hope it's good. I know a lot of people grind the absolute shit out of that game, so... Yeah, good stuff. Uh, awesome Prime is asking if I am the last unicorn. I am not the last unicorn. I didn't update my fucking stream, <laughs> did I? Game yep. talk shows. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I'm sick. Whoops. It's fine. I was playing Eternity, the last unicorn, a few days ago, and I forgot to update my stream information. The less said about me playing it is probably the better. <laughs> oh, man. Let's see. Other news. EA has revealed that the new need that we're going to be getting a new need for speed in Plants vs. Zombies game this fall. Uh, I'm sure this means Plants vs. Zombies Garden Warfare 3, but it is a shame that Burnout is still getting ignored while we get yet another need for speed game coming out. Uh, the last need for speed was not that good. No. And that's a damn shame, because I I typically like Need for Speed. The last couple Need for Speeds have not been that good. Uh, the, the one before this last one wasn't awful. Me and Studa played quite a bit of it. But I convinced him we liked the one before this last one so well that we jumped ahead and bought the, the last one, and we're both like, ooh. Which one, the live action one? Yeah, we had made a mistake as well. Yeah, say. yeah, you did. <laughs> and uh, we never played it. <laughs> so we don't talk about it. It's just a thing that happened. <laughs> yeah, that, that sure was a game that exists. And uh, that face. However, I am totally 
psyched for more Plants vs. Zombies. I know last year everybody was holding their breath for Garden Warfare 3 and we didn't get it and we were sad as shit. So if they're going to release it this year and then turn around and be like, this fall, then like, fuck yeah, bring it on. I'm yeah, down that'd be for that. awesome. And it, while they're at it, if they could announce Peggle 3, I wouldn't be mad at them. <laughs> I mean, there's no confirmation that it is Garden Warfare 3, but that's everyone's guess. Uh, there's a new a PVZ well, coming. The, we already knew there was a new PVZ coming, too. We just didn't know it was going to be released this year. Yeah. Because they had teased it a couple months back. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we were already aware. So we can infer, based on the details we've been given so far, that it looks like Garden Warfare 3 is going to be this fall. But yeah. nothing's been confirmed yet, so they could pull a old switcheroo and give us like plants versus zombies dating sim uh, i would play the shit out of that i'd play the I shit out of it too i wouldn't even be a little mad not even no time saying since it's three it should be plants versus zombies versus mechs <laughs> yeah there was a titanfall character. crossover but there was a character with a mech in the last one yeah the grass <laughs> effect <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I have a statue of that dude too. <laughs> it was incredible. I wonder if uh if I'm pointing at it or not. No, right there. Yeah, right there is my little mass effect dude. Grass <laughs> effect. That's funny. I'll show that off later on. But uh last bit of news I have is that uh Senator Josh Hawley, a Republican from Missouri, has announced a bill that would ban loot boxes and pay to win tra- microtransactions in games played by minors. Did you hear about that news? No. Yeah, it looks like uh the the big thing that he's targeting seems to be like Candy Crush stuff like that, but it this this I don't know, this could be both good and bad. I think getting the legal system involved is a bit much. Mm -hmm. I I think the ESRB should uh, self-regulate what they're doing with loot boxes and microtransactions. I know they came out and said that a number of countries have said that they're not considered gambling and they're not predatory. But, you know, they are plenty of games that absolutely are predatory. And then you look at stuff like Fortnite that is just. How many whales are there involved with Fortnite that just drop money and money and money and money and money into that game? Yeah. There's people who bought consoles because it came packaged with an exclusive skin for Fortnite. That's when you got more sense than you got sense. Yes. <laughs> um, see, as a bleeding heart liberal, I am diametrically opposed to anything that a Republican Agreed. <laughs> Recommend. Like, as soon as he said Republican, I'm like, God damn it. I know. It. I know. I, I feel so the I same way. I know this isn't a political podcast, but fuck Republicans. Um, as an aside, <laughs> I also really fucking hate loot boxes. Yeah. And I I do think the ESRB needs to regulate them better. Um, I don't know how I feel about actual legislation over it though yeah no time for games is saying that the government regulates enough shit and that the free market has done a pretty good job of telling publishers when games suck and need to be rethought uh kind of like anthem yeah and uh what was the star wars battlefront 2 oh yeah battlefront 2 i mean that came out it's and and no time is right if it was a democrat i would probably still be like eh, but do we really need that (laughs) you know yeah um I'm just more inclined to automatically cringe when I'm the Republican again. <laughs> Cannot help it. I'm We've sorry. We've been conditioned guys. over the past two years. It's been a rough couple years, guys. Uh, <laughs> but at this point, I don't think anybody's surprised to hear me talk like that anyway on here. But um, me and my feminist agenda all time interrupting <laughs> the <this> show. <laughs> but um, anyway, yeah, I just, I, I don't know that legislation is the best way to go about it i think i think the 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 ersb esrb how do you say that esrb yeah there we go uh it's been a long <laughs> it's been a long week um they they need to get their shit together though and do something more yeah something needs to be done about microtransactions uh, the consumer backlash has been growing more and more and more we've seen that with games like mortal kombat where 
just having the ability to have microtransactions in a game is, you know, there's a lot of backlash. Yeah. One of the things that that gets me about that, though, is that you can't really entirely rely on the backlash. It helps. It yeah. does. And And I'm not negating that. But for everybody that bitches about it like us, there's 10 more that are just coughing up the money anyway. Yeah. And it's like the the squeaky wheel gets the grease. But in this case, we're making the wheel squeak and they're just pouring money at it. And so it's muffling us. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, the the corporations, they hear the money first and they don't give a fuck what the rest of us are saying. So I don't know. It's it takes it takes a pretty egregious um, offense to to piss off enough people to get things changed. True, could be done, but it's not easy. I just don't think legislation is the right way to go about this situation. No, I think I can agree with you there. Yeah. Anyway, that's the news that I got. Anything you want to talk about? I actually did have some news. Ooh. I wrote shit down. I was all smart. Um, Look at you being prepared and shit. I know. I, I, like, I have full-on essays here. <laughs> <laughs> so Microsoft recently teamed up with the Department of Veterans Affairs, and they have brought 22 rehabilitation centers adaptive controllers. Nice. And the VA staff will be providing feedback to Microsoft's accessibility team on how those controllers um, affect therapy and and their usage and, and what could be changed to make them better for for veterans. So that's a I thought that was impressive. It's a big deal to partner up. They said that the 22 centers that they rolled this out to are just the start and they do expect to expand and include more centers as well. That's really cool. Yeah. And they're not content with that. Microsoft um, recently patented a, a new controller that is modified for visually impaired gamers. Really? Yes, the controller, it looks like an elite controller. Um, however, the buttons, the face buttons do not have lettering. They have braille, raised braille on them. And then um, where the paddles are on the back, there's an extra row of paddles. So there's six in total instead of just four. The paddles have braille on them. Oh, and that's cool. They, um, the patent also said some things about... Um, vibration output for braille so it the the output would kind of be like morse code that they could um read in a way and then there was also an accessory pack that could be attached to the back side of the controller that would be able to relay braille outputs as well that so is really neat text on the screen um text chat any games that uh don't have verbal dialogue and, and rely exclusively on text on the screen would suddenly be available to visually impaired gamers. That is really neat. Yeah. So I have, I have high hopes. I want to see that come to fruition. Cause I know there's, there's quite a few people who could benefit from that. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. I, I love that Microsoft is doing this stuff. Yeah. It's awesome. It is every, very awesome. Every time I see something new from the, the adaptability team, I'm like, fuck yeah, keep going, guys. <laughs> it was such a, a hard sell for them to get Microsoft behind them, but it's been so positively uh, received and, and it's done so well that Microsoft just wants to stick with it. They realize they've done something good. Why not? Yeah, there's there's nearly no negative feedback about mm -hmm. the adaptive controller, and the people that are talking shit about it are like hardcore, uh, either PC Master Race or Sony fanboys who are like, "Oh, that's such a stupid idea. Why would you bother doing that?" Yeah, and it's it's interesting. I, I'm I'm always surprised when PC junkies are like Whoa, over it because it works with a PC too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and I'm like, so just plug that bitch in. <laughs> 
I think I, I saw someone say that they, they got the adaptive controller working with a switch. That was me telling you that. I saw Did the video. Say it? Yeah, there's um there's a little dongle that you can get and you can make the adaptive controller work with a Nintendo Switch. That is so cool. Yeah. It's really impressive. Uh, one other thing. Did you did you see the Ghost Recon trailer? I did not. I know that the <gasps> that the the existence of the game was leaked by their own store collector Leaks. edition. Uh, yeah. The and then airport. they announced it today, Thursday, that we're recording this, but I didn't get to see a trailer for it. I've been very, very sick. I bet. But they, they, it's fucking incredible. Does it look good? Oh, my God. Like, there's just... <sighs> it's so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> it's Great really, description. It really fucking... It, like, I can't describe the way, just in the environment, the way the light shines through the trees. And and just... There's one scene... Um, they released... They released the trailer, and they also re- released a gameplay video so you could actually see what one of the missions looked like. Mm -hmm. And like, there's one instance where the character is getting swarmed by the, the enemy and he literally camouflages himself in the mud. And that's a gameplay mechanic. That is not just, Hey, we did this in the video. Look how cool it looks. If you, (laughs) if you could do this, it was, no, this is in the game. This is what is happening. This is what he can do. That is and awesome. He's, he's laying prone and they scoot forward a little bit into some mud and then he scoots back again and covers himself up in the mud and spreads it on his face and he lays there as they, they walk past him. And he becomes, <laughs> it's, it's prone camo and it's just, oh. and on one hand you want to be like, those idiots. <laughs> but on the other hand, you're like, that's so fucking cool. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to watch this trailer. So it is, it is absolutely stunning. And the big, uh, there was a big reveal. First off, the, they took a page out of the divisions book. Um, one of the very big aspects of the division, as far as like PVP play goes, is that, um, agents go rogue and they turn against the division and hunt down other agents. Um, so they kind of took a page from that for Ghost Recon, which is the new one is called Breakpoint. Um, and the ghosts are being hunted by rogue ghosts called the wolves. And the leader of the wolves was revealed to be played by John Berthal. Oh. Yeah. Nice. And it's, they're, um, it's incredible because you hear the, the narrated voice talking, you know, over, to, over the whole uh, trailer. And he's, you know, describing where ghosts were sent in and out before anybody else even knows and and he's all this you know we stick together with our brothers and sisters and they they really are driving it home that you know the importance of of protecting each other and everything and then at the very end when john bernthal's character removes his mask he says uh well i was i'm a ghost too and i expected no less and that's how you realize that they've done the whole rogue thing. Mm. And it's just, oh, it plays through so well. It's absolutely incredible. All right. Um, so I'm, I'm going to watch this trailer after the show. <laughs> one other thing about it, Ghost Recon Wildlands got a lot of shit for its location. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, for obvious reasons <laughs> that were very deserved. But um, so this time they've actually set it on a fictional island called or or. Oroa, I believe it is. That's how you hmm. pronounce that. So, yeah, but it's a, a fictional island to, you know, kind of clean up the fuckery that they did with Wildlands. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, good luck to them on it. I, I know it's, uh, David was watching it and like before the trailer even ends, he's like, please tell me that comes out this year. And, uh, good news, it does. October 4th. <laughs> Yay. Yay. So I'm excited. I I played Wildlands a little, but I couldn't get Studa into it. But I sent him that trailer, and he was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> <laughs> so you said October fourth, right? October fourth. I'm writing that down. Yeah, that is surprisingly not far away. I keep a like a little spreadsheet of all the games that are coming out that I'm interested in getting. Damn. 
so I could keep track of when they release the game title, how much they are, what system they're on, whether or not I pre-ordered it. I have problems. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have a lot of problems. I say that like I'm not sitting here <laughs> with my day planner. And, like, I've got kids' birthdays, and I've got school events written down, and then I've got embargo dates. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I get it. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Anyway, speaking of embargo, should we get to some reviews? Let's do some motherfucking reviews. All right, because we got a bunch to go through tonight. Uh, the first game to talk about is called Fade to Silence, developed by Black Forest Games, published by THQ Nordic, released April 30th on Xbox One and PS4 for forty nine ninety nine. Fade to Silence takes players into a frozen post-apocalyptic world where defying nature's threats and enemies is key. A compelling mix of puzzling story, a constant strife for resources, balancing short-term needs versus your long-term goals, and a tense atmospheric mood make this game a unique survival adventure. Cole, tell us about Fade to Silence. So, spoiler alert, I had two favorites this week, and this is one of them. Ooh. This game scratches an itch that hasn't been scratched since I played The Flame in the Flood. Oh. That is a big deal because anybody that knows me knows that The Flame in the Flood is like my top. Yeah, that's up there for you. game ever. I love it. And so this comes very, very close. Now, it wasn't flawless, and I'll get to that in a minute. But for the game itself, it's a winter-themed survival roguelot. And it takes place in a post-apocalyptic world, but there you don't have hardly any information about what's going on. The, there's narration from this mysterious gravelly voice and like the spirit that that's very ominous hovering around you. And you understand that there's corruption and fuck tons of snow and you're going to die if you're not very careful. <laughs> 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 and that's all you really get to start with. Um, and it actually takes quite a bit of game playing and a lot of building and exploring before you get any more. I don't want to give any spoilers away, but before you any, get any kind of real backstory, it's, it's easy to be like, I'm just hoping for the best here. <laughs> and the flame and the flood was the same way. You didn't get a, any kind of like explanation for why the fuck shit happened. It just did. And you were there. And so this this is kind of the same concept. Um, much like other survival roguelites, you're going to have to collect firewood so that you can build a fire so that you don't freeze to fucking death. But you're not on your own, unlike Flame in the Flood. To, to begin with, you have a daughter. Um, and and she is she's dependent on you. You need to provide food. You need to provide heat. You need to build your... Um, your home back because it has been destroyed. So, um, the roguelite element comes in when you used up all of your flames of hope and your home and everything will be destroyed and you have to start again. Um, it is a roguelite as opposed to like, you know, being full on fuck you permadeath <laughs> because you do get a couple of chances you you can you can find flames of hope you start off with 3 and what do or, they do or um they basically let you revive you will you still die and you're not where you were you'll go back to a checkpoint at the very beginning mm. and then the horrible corruption monster is like yes i'm not done with you it, emerge from my womb and you're like you're really gross <laughs> <laughs> you're kind of creepy I, i'm gonna find you and murder you just because you make comments like that <laughs> 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 uh, it's a little unnerving and it's supposed to be because there's supposed to be a horror element to it all obviously but you're just like eh, i'm gonna murder you for that uh, spoiler alert, I never murdered him. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting because, there. Yeah, the game is hard, but it's not so hard that you can't manage. Um, but anyway, as I was saying from the, the, the flames, you can find them and they let you respawn back at the start and you don't lose all your shit, basically, is what happens. Um, but if you run out of those, then it's permadeath, start all over, fuck you, you should have found some flame. Or been more careful. <laughs> um, 
you do have the crafting element. You need to find weapons. You need to craft them. Um, craft an axe so you can take down a tree so that you can make a bow and then you need to uh, hunt for reindeer and if you can shoot and take down a reindeer then the area that that deer is tied to becomes hunting ground for your people so as you're progressing in this open world which is it's scary as fuck to have an open world game be a roguelite at the same time uh, yeah. it just it just makes even going out to explore incredibly uncomfortable. You're just like, <laughs> at any moment, something could fuck me. <laughs> and I'm done. But um, you you ideally kind of want to play it like an Ubisoft open world, where you, you want to take over the area so that, you know, your people can spread. You'll, you'll build followers up so that you become stronger and take out more corruption and hope that you don't get wrecked before it's all over and done with. Um, one interesting thing that did kind of bug me, there are two modes to playing this game, um, permadeath and without. And if you play it without permadeath, then you don't get any achievements. Really? None. Nothing. Easy mode is a total shutout. Oh, wow. That sucks. You get no rewards. So it's like, don't do that, developers. Okay? <laughs> That's not good for people who need to play easier difficulties for accessibility reasons. I've bitched about that on the show a dozen times. And it, it is a strikeout against it. Now, as an aside, because it does have the Flame of Hope aspect to it, Awesome um, prime a game telling you get good. <laughs> yeah, basically. But because it does have the flame of hope aspect to it and you can find them and you can find shards of them and, and craft them, it is easy enough to just be careful and make sure that you're, you know, if I take a risk to go run up to something and get wrecked, the worst that's going to happen is I spawn back. Or am I going to permanently die and I need to take it easy and go look for something first? Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's really your fucking fault <laughs> if you run out and die. Um, but it's not, it's still just disappointing to see the whole fuck you, you get nothing even though you played it aspect. I just don't care for that, that yeah. decision making as far as that goes. Now... <sighs> For as much as I have enjoyed the game, for as much as I love it, for as much as I say that this is one of my favorites this week and I'm going to put so much goddamn time into this game before all is <laughs> said and done, I will say it is not flawless. The combat can be a little on the clunky side. You're limited by stamina and, I mean, it makes sense, but it's still a pain in the ass if you're getting swarmed by enemies and you're like, well... <laughs> I can't roll away now. Um, it, it's the amount of stamina it takes to carry out certain tasks, even mundane shit, just like swinging, swinging an axe or pulling the bow back is, is a little frustrating. And I did have some issues with getting stuck in the terrain. Um, my very first run through the game, I put in about two hours of it. I was rolling. I was doing so good. And then I got stuck beside of a tree in a snowbank. And I could not go anywhere. I couldn't roll out of it. I couldn't jump out of it. I couldn't do shit. Hmm. And I had to close the game down. I started it back up. Still stuck. Oh, no. And I'm like, well, fuck you too. <laughs> and I had to just crap to save and start over and that do it sucks. over again. So that was frustrating. And that was, and there were other instances where I would get stuck. Sometimes it would be more severe than others. Sometimes I would have to crash the game, relaunch and hope I was back in the, the, you know, starting point. Other times I'd be able to just like wiggle for an hour <laughs> and get myself. <laughs> and you're sitting there like, I will not fucking give up <laughs> <laughs> i'm carrying too much shit <laughs> but it, it that's definitely something that could use some work um is this a little more polish some of the animations for cutscenes not as smooth as they could be 
but they're also not so bad that you're like, ah, oh, this is unplayable. It's just like you're watching it and you're going, eh, they could have done some interesting thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> but that's me being picky. Yeah. Uh, but it was otherwise, I just, I really enjoyed this game and I had such a good time with it. I love shit like this and I don't think we get enough of these weird, just make you wonder what the fuck you're doing when you're playing it kind of survival games. And it's just, just scratched every itch I had. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> Well, I'm sure I don't even need to ask, but 50 bucks on Fade to Silence, what do you say? I, I give it a buy it. I really do. It's niche, and normally I would be a little more hesitant to give a buy it to a niche game, especially one that's got some some really fucked up bugs, like getting stuck in the world. Mm. But man, we don't get enough games of this variety, and, and I just, it's it's enjoyable. It's so weird and just creepy, and <sighs> I do like it. Awesome. Sounds good. Yeah. Next. <laughs> All right. Next game to talk about is uh, next game to talk about is called Final Fantasy 12, the Zodiac Age provided to us free by Square Enix for the purpose of this review. <laughs> As usual with Square Enix games, we have to say it. They want us to say it. So consider this ad content or, you know, supported content, whatever. Uh, but anyway, developed and published by Square Enix, released April 30th on Xbox One and Switch for $49.99. Vaughn, a young man who lost his family to the fires of war, lives a stoic existence in the occupied city of Rabinaster while dreaming of a life of freedom, soaring the skies as a sky pirate. Princess Ash, the last remaining member of the Dalmascan royal family, vows revenge on the Empire and secretly leads a resistance in the hopes of restoring her homeland. Brought together in a chaotic age, the hopes and dreams of these two heroes will unite the fates of the people and change the destiny of nations. That's kind of a spoiler, now that I'm reading <laughs> it. That kind of gives away Princess Ash, but yeah, I, I guess it's not too much. It's still early in the game, but anyway, Dark Mika covered this one, wrote in a review, and here's what she's got to say. <clears throat> Final Fantasy XII is a JRPG in the long-running series of games that have absolutely nothing to do with each other. Thank God for that, since most of the game's stories are convoluted messes. In this, you play as a group of people led by Vaughn and Orphan Teen. Two countries have ended hostilities as one kind of just teabagged the other, and now Vaughn's country is under new, mostly unwelcome management. Vaughn ends up getting deep into deep shit as he tries to steal from the old treasury in order to, quote, give back to his people of his home. And by give back, I mean so he can buy an airship and become a sky pirate. This is his story, a story of getting into deep shit, clawing his way back out, only to take a step and land in a deeper, worse pile of shit and do it all over again. Because our because our Vaughn here, he's a smirt boy. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, boy. Uh, this plays slightly different than most Final Fantasy games. It's still a turn-based game, but the characters aren't static like they are in most of them. The whole time you're in combat, you can move around the field. You can even run away in the middle of a fight, but the opponents will chase you, which is useful since you can use that to kite enemies away just enough that you can fight them one at a time. Though this also means as you run away like a little orphan bitch, you could still get hit sometimes since enemies are faster than you. However, after a certain distance, even if they've been close enough to you that their junk smacks you in the back of the head every step of the way, they'll just give up since you've left their invisible territory line. Doing this can be good for kiting, however, if you screw up, it also brings them back to full health, which sucks. The characters don't just level up and learn new stuff in this either. You have a grid which you unlock the ability to use skills, get stat increases, use magic, and even equip different weapons and armor. Typical fare, however, you then have to buy all this stuff, including scrolls, to learn the abilities you've unlocked. So basically, you can pay to unlock the ability to learn Cure, but then you have to buy the Cure ability so that the person who learned it can use it. So it's interesting, but I don't really like buying the ability to learn the skill. That's just buying it twice. I'd rather just be able to use it right then and there. My White Mage is 90% completely and utterly worthless. <laughs> I have her grid completely filled, but not even half of her abilities have been sold to me. So while she can learn them, I can't buy the scrolls to teach her any of it. Once you get the scroll that teaches cure whatever, anyone who has the unlocked ability in their grid gets to use it as well. So you don't have to buy five cure scrolls or anything, just one. And they all know it. Uh, the upgrade system is a bit convoluted. It's interesting, but annoys the ever loving fuck out of me. <laughs> I didn't mind it. I thought it was, I enjoyed the grid system. <clears throat> anyway, there are upgrades from the old PS2 version of the game. I feel like the graphics were upgraded a little bit, not a lot. I disagree there. The game looks fucking gorgeous on the Xbox One X. I know it was, uh, 
originally supposed to be 4K, but for some reason it's not in 4K, but it does hmm. run at 60 frames per second, which is the only version of the game to do so. Oh, nice. So that's cool. Yeah, game looks great, though. Uh, there's two different types of cutscenes. one that uses in-game models, which I think were upgraded uh, along with the in-game models, obviously, and full real cutscenes, which I think were upgraded a fuck ton. It's been a long time since I played the PS2 version, though, so maybe I'm wrong and it's not as upgraded as, as it feels like it is. Oh, it's definitely upgraded a lot more than you think. Uh, <laughs> seriously, go look at the PS2 version of the game in its majestic 480p. <laughs> And then compare it to this, and uh, it's it's like night and day. It is a gorgeous game. Uh, the music has been upgraded, but they also give you an option to pick from three different tracks for the game. The original, the reorchestrated, and the original soundtrack version. I think the reorchestrated has the best quality, followed by the OST, then the original. There's also an option to go at two or four times the speed, which is insanely useful. I put more than 80 hours into the PS2 version way back when, and I passed that area in this version around 35 hours in, so in less than half the time, I got even further. It is fantastic. They also unlock, tr unlock Trials mode from the start, which is a small 100-wave horde mode. It originally unlocked after beating the game, but you still need to be high level to beat it, so I don't know why it's unlocked from the start. At 50 bucks on Switch, Steam, PS4, Xbox One, it's upgraded, but it's still the same game. I would have liked to see it released at 30 or 40, however, this has Fran in it, and she's the hot bunny girl who wears what is effectively a G-string, so quite frankly, her ass alone literally would have made me buy this game. <laughs> <laughs> So I say f go for it if you like Final Fantasy games or if you like RPGs. If you don't like them, though, this isn't going to be for you. It's still a 60 to 80 hour game, so you're going to get your money's worth. Uh, I have poured a ton of time into this as well, and I I think it's worth the 50 bucks. I'm, I guess I'm just used to Square games being more expensive than other remasters. I, I call it the Square Enix tax. Yeah. I've mentioned that on the show a bunch of times, but. You know, when people were saying, oh, I hope it comes out at $20, I'm like, motherfucker, you've got to be, <laughs> you you are crazy if you think it's going to come out at 20 bucks. It would have been nice to see it come out cheaper, but I, I still think at 50 bucks, it's totally worth it. It's one of my all-time favorite Final Fantasy games. It looks great. It plays great. It's, I love the combat system, and I've always called it like a single-player MMO. Yeah. And in, in how the combat system works, it's just, it works really well. And the Gambit system, which Dark Mika didn't even get the chance to get into, uh, the Gambit system in the, the combat is kind of like programming how you want your companions to act. Like you, you have a list of commands that they can do, like, and they take priority from top to bottom. So if the first one's like, if companion has less than 30% health, heal. Yeah. And that's like if enemy is, you know, closest enemy, target them. Uh, if, you know, I don't, there are just so many different options to do the gambits with. It's, it's kind of like programming language where you have conditions and requirements and they'll act on them. Otherwise they'll go to the next one. Otherwise they'll go to the next one. It's, it's easier in theory than in explaining it once you get yeah. your hands on it and get to actually work with the gambit system and it unlocks it slowly through the game. Like it doesn't start you off with 30 slots that you have to manually adjust everything. They start you off with two just to ease you in and you unlock more slots as the game goes on, giving you more freedom and more customization with your party members to the point where you don't even have to play the game. The game could just play itself if you really wanted it to. <laughs> yeah. It's it's really cool. I love Final Fantasy XII, so I'm thrilled it's on Xbox, and I I would give it my wholehearted recommendation. Nice. Yeah, I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. <laughs> uh, next game to talk about is called Fell Seal Arbiter's Mark, developed by Six Eyes Studio, published by One C Entertainment, released April 30th on Xbox One, PS4, and PC for twenty nine ninety nine. Fell Seal Arbiter's Mark is a turn-based tactical RPG with a focus on storytelling and strategic battles. Unfold a mature story as you progress through a handcrafted scenarios, controlling your own group of Arbiters, with each character customizable from a wide selection of classes and abilities. Cole, tell us about it. So we have a, like you said, a turn-based RPG. It's set in the fantasy world of Tiara. Um, a, a band of seven heroes had previously saved the world and they were immortalized as a reward. And um, they have a class of arbiters who basically serve as like their soldier slash law enforcement combo. 
and players take on the role of an arbiter named Kiri. Kiri is um kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place without giving away any spoilers. The game has a shit ton of, of twists and turns in the plot. And so it's really hard to talk about it without even giving away st- spoilers like within the first 20 minutes. You're like, oh boy. I can't tell you that. Um, <laughs> well, the Final but, Fantasy description gave away spoilers in the first few hours of the game. So you can I give know. away minor spoilers. <laughs> so, um, okay. So if Kiri they're early enough. Finds, yeah, it's, it's literally just the very beginning of the game. But Kiri finds herself and, and her party in a position to where um, they witness a crime. And it's the first battle that players take on where you have to capture um, the aristocrat who has carried out this this murder. And then you're tasked with guiding him back to, to the city where the immortals are so that he can be punished for his crime. Um, but when one of the immortals decides to give up his immortality and step down. Um, Somebody has to be deemed worthy and marked. And the marked people go on a pilgrimage to a special city and they get to ascend. So basically, the Arbiters are stuck with protecting these people who are marked. And the marked people, they can do no wrong. They're above the law. Nothing can touch them, not even arbiters. Um, so Kiri finds herself in a pretty situ- shitty situation when the aristocrat that she has arrested and marched to the city becomes marked. So she's trying to take him in and see that he gets punished for murder, and now he gets to go on this sacred pilgrimage and is untouchable by the law. Oh, nice. That's um, how to do it. That's yeah, and uh, that's it's a, it's an incredibly insane twist, and it's literally like within the first thirty minutes of the game, and it just sets up for how many insane plot twists and turns you're going to run into while you're playing this. Nice. Um, the story just it just does not slow down. Um, I, I, it was incredibly impressive for gameplay. Um, as I said, it's turn-based RPG, and you. <laughs> There's basically an, an overworld map and the cities are alongside the road marked as a dot and you can just kind of on rails move a little icon back and forth between them and choose if you need to um, visit a store or if you want to recruit some allies or anything like that. You can do that from that overworld menu. If your um, If your party has some kind of event in that city though, Then it goes into an isometric view and you'll have the battlefield laid out like a map. Um, Not like a cartographer type map, but just you have a set area where your battle is going to take place. And that is that is a grid based system for that area. And you will have to use strategy and and make the best out of the talents and, and everything that your characters have in order to overcome any obstacles in their path on that battlefield. Um, each battlefield has its own like challenges and perks, especially in comparison to the types of abilities that the characters have. I'm trying so hard to make sure I'm <laughs> that I don't fuck up and slip anything. <laughs> um, so for example, some of, some of the classes have what's called a forced push and they can, use magic and push back an enemy that gets too close to them on the grid. In addition to pushing that enemy back, it's also going to have like a domino effect and hit anybody behind them. Or if you're in a position where the map is leveled, you could push them off and they would take fall damage. Sweet. You can even flat out push them off the map completely. (laughs) Um, Do they just die then? Yeah. They do. Sweet. <laughs> um, so it's it's really awesome to try to find different ways to use the magic uh, spells that the different classes have, or or the different types of fight mechanics, and like set everybody up in a way that you're going to get to take advantage of those. And then it's kind of like watching dominoes fall, and it's just so incredible <laughs> when you can pull it off. Um, there, there are some quirks to fighting. 
not unlike you see in other games like this. Um, if you do more damage if you attack from the front or the side. But you got to watch your own flank because you can get damaged more from the back and the side as well, for example. Um, so it's really all about thinking strategically about where you're going to put your characters, who's got the the best effects for long range, who's got the best effects for close range, where are you going to put your healer so that they don't get their shit punched in. <laughs> <laughs> don't lose your healers. Uh, <laughs> And then it's it's a lot of fun to just try and and set it up in a way that it you're just going to be able to like blow through the battlefield and and do one or two moves and just watch everything fall in the way that you planned it. That doesn't always happen though because the the AI are super smart. And if you leave so much as one side open, they are coming for you. <laughs> they they want to make your dominoes fall. So you really have to be careful and knock you um, off the stage. They they can too, and they if don't put two people close together unless you know you've got them protected. Because if one takes a hit, bumps into the other, they take a hit too. So it really is you have to be super careful about your placement, and you will learn that the hard way. The first battle is almost kind of deceptive. Because you're like, nah, fuck this guy. I'm blowing through everybody. And you will, and it's fine. And then you go into the second and third and later battles, and they just get more complicated and, and turn into bigger fights, and you have more people on the battlefield. And you're just like, holy fuck, I'm not even trying to play in anything amazing. I just hope I don't get pushed off. <laughs> <laughs> don't let me die to something fucking dumb. <laughs> And you will. You will probably die to something fucking dumb. Nice. Um, there's an interesting mechanic where if your characters die, of course you have potions and things like that, and you can revive them. Um, but if they, if you don't revive them while they're in battle, then they stay in an injured status until you take them to a town to rest. So they they don't come all the way back just because you in the battle. It's it's tough. It really is. Because if you don't pay attention, I had the problem if I have a lot of people on the battlefield at once and then I don't see when somebody gets fucked. And then I go into the next fight and I'm like, but where's my soldier? And it's because they're injured and they can't do shit. Uh. <laughs> so you have to be a little more careful and, and plan not just for the current battle, but for future battles. Or otherwise, you're just shit out of luck. <laughs> um, the game is beautifully illustrated, especially the environments. Character models are a little quirky. I don't, I don't know how many people are gonna understand this reference, but back in like the early 2000s internet era, there used to be things that that um, artists made when they were trying to stretch their legs and get started programming and things like that it was called a doll maker <laughs> and basically what you would do is you would code up in javascript you can tell i've done this a few times yeah. um you would draw out it was like a digital paper doll you would have several different hairstyles you would have a couple different bases you would have some different clothes for the different poses and then people could just drag and drop it together and make a doll and use it as an avatar um the character sprites in this when you're creating now like Kiri and, and Rainier and some of the other ones that are, are hard coded into the game, they look fantastic. But when you have the ability to make your own characters, <laughs> they kind of look like the dragon top dolls. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really, I was really impressed like the options that they had. So you, you didn't, even if you were like making wizards, they not all the wizards were going to look the same. Every one you made was different, it had a different name, and it had different stats. And and you just like you end up with a bit of a marching rainbow <laughs> going across some of those battlefields. If you're me, um, I enjoyed it a little more than I should have, but it did look <laughs> a little funny and kind of out of place. <laughs> um, that said. It, it was really, really pretty. I wish there were more character animations, though. Um, even when you're, like, 
you're attacking with some big major spell and there's going to be fire and ice raining down and it's just the same basic attack move as if you just hit them. <laughs> and the enemy's response, unless they get knocked back, they just kind of stand there and take it. There's there's no reaction. And it was I was just a little disappointed in that. No. Oh. Yeah, I would have liked to have seen, because there's so much effort, especially with the environments, to make it look nice that it was like, okay, but couldn't have paid for a few extra animations? <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> it would it would have been nice to have seen that kind of fleshed out a little more. But yeah. everything else is forgivable enough and that it's enjoyable, and, and I'm not mad about it. Cool. So for 30 bucks, what do you think of Fell Seal? I give it a buy it. It's it's definitely a harder game that's gonna appeal to the to, to the tactical crowd that like if you like like Final Fantasy Tactics or Wargroove, then you, this is like a no brainer pickup. Nice. Yeah. I've had my eye on this one for a while, so I might have to give it a go. I'm a little surprised you haven't already because it seems right up your alley. <laughs> I just don't have thirty bucks. But I'm getting close. Do you know why? Why? Because No Time just dropped 300 biddies. Oh, boy. So you know what that means. Yeah. Oh, dropping bits. Oh, I love it. George, you are the best. <laughs> he is the best. Let's hear it again. Dropping bits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Thank you, No Time. <laughs> it is always awesome getting biddies from you. I appreciate it. Uh, Carnage one more time. All right. Fuck it. One more time. <laughs> Drop it. Oh, because Carnage dropped 100 biddies. Nice. So, fuck it. One more time. Oh, dropping bits. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so fun. I can't help it. I can't you know, help it. The funny it. thing about that is that I have to giggle along for the for the sake of the show, but I can't even hear you it. You can't hear it at all. You have no <laughs> clue what's going on. So, I just have to, like feel it out and be like okay joe laughs so it must be done <laughs> yeah that's that's why i laugh when it's done playing so that it gives you a cue that yeah. it's finished <laughs> that behind the scenes shit that nobody knows <laughs> we're letting the secrets out today yeah <laughs> <laughs> so there we go 400 biddies between no time and carnage mostly no time although carnage you know he tried yeah he made an effort. <laughs> it was like That's, he got that one achievement and he's done. So. Yeah. He, <laughs> he bean dropped. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, next game to talk about is called The Adventures of Bertram Fiddle, Episode 1, A Dreadly Business, developed by Rumpus Animation, published by Chorus Worldwide Games, released May 8th on Xbox One for four ninety nine. In a quirky take on Victorian London inhabited by strange characters with even stranger noses, self-proclaimed leading explorator Bertram Fiddle finds himself in a bit of a pickle. Help him follow the clues and track down the elusive serial killer known only as Jeff the Murderer before he strikes again. Cole, tell us about Bertram Fiddle. You know how I said I had two favorites this week? This is the other? This is the other. I fucking knew it. This is so incredibly quirky. You can't help but love it. You spend the whole game just going, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> and then you go, yeah, I guess that makes sense. But why? <laughs> why does it make sense for you throw a Tyrannosaurus Rex arm into the dog crate just to get the dog to go in it? Mm-hmm. A rare T-Rex arm. And you, and then he's like, it's my favorite artifact. And then you never see it again. <laughs> what and about the eyes on the dog? I can't get over the eyes on that dog. <laughs> that is the doofiest the wall eyes dog. staring in different directions. <laughs> I, that is some hardcore derp is what that is. <laughs> Cockeyed eyes on and animated characters are my favorite thing. Foofy. Foofy. Foofy! Everything in this is as ridiculous as Foofy. It is. It is the so guy, good. The murderer's name is literally Jeff the Murderer. And I'm assuming that's a rip on Jack the Ripper, but it's just Jeff. Jeff the Murderer. Just and Jeff. It, it, 
It's just so ridiculous. <laughs> you know what the the Bertram Fiddle is is a um a detective a la Sherlock Sherlock Holmes is even in the damn game. Sherlock and Watson. <laughs> And they basically think you're an idiot. You kind of are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell them I said that, though. <laughs> but you have a, a sidekick named Gavin. Gavin is a cyclops. And you know what I kept thinking the whole time that Gavin reminded me of? Uh. The the alien from One Eyed Cook. Oh, that game. Yeah. Do you remember? He just, from everything about him standing there and staring, just reminded me of that damn one-eyed alien from One-Eyed Cook. <laughs> it was so weird. Anyway, weirdness is I well, there is no weirdness aside. The whole goddamn game is weird. Yeah, there's no uh, aside to the weirdness. It is all weirdness. It is a point and click. I, the interesting thing about how odd this is as a point and click is that it still feels incredibly intuitive. It's so easy for these games to take the odd solutions so out into left field that you can't figure them out on your own. Deponia is really bad for that. Um, just, just the the answer the the main character is so harebrained and does such weird shit that you can't figure out how to solve it because it's just nothing you a normal person would think of. <laughs> and in a way. Bertram Fiddler does this, you know? He He's like, he does really weird, dumb shit, but it feels like a natural solution to the puzzle at the time. Yeah. And that's, I, I, I don't know if that's better or worse. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like, the answer every, is yes. <laughs> every time you pick up an item, you're like, oh, I know what to fucking do with this. It's a toilet brush that I got out of an outhouse, and I'm going to use it to fake some kids out into thinking it's cotton candy. <laughs> That's a thing you do. <laughs> oh, God. So and good. Can, can we just take a moment to point out that one of the characters' name is Lord Arthwap? Arthwap. That's definitely supposed to be Asswap. What? Really? <laughs> no. And the first time it said it, I was like, no. Lord oh Arthwipe. Oh, my God. Again. And then the pictures of Lord Arth. Oh. How is it they say? Photomonographs? I think it's what they call them. Photomographs. Is it photomographs? Yeah. So. <laughs> and so, like, you still know exactly what you're doing, even as much as they try to throw you off with the weirdness. Yeah, it is so ridiculous. It's, and it is funny. It is so crap. obscenely funny. It is, it's not fair how funny this game is when uh -uh. some other games try being funny. It's like they did it on accident because it's just so natural. Yeah. Oh, so good. It is. It is so incredibly good. I hope we don't have to wait long for the sequel because this does end on a to be continued. There is an episode two. Yes, there is. And you just left hanging. Like I, I was so sad when I, yeah, I was like, but I, I need more. <laughs> I gotta know what happens with Jeff the murderer. <laughs> I have questions. Just Jeff. Just Jeff. Jeff I want to point murderer. something out though. This game is Xbox Play anywhere. Really? Yeah, and I can tell you that because I played the whole fucking thing on my computer while David was playing Farming Simulator on the Xbox. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't <laughs> realize it was Play Anywhere. And uh, I, I had started it on the computer, or on the Xbox, and then he was like, oh, I want to play. I was like, God, I got to work on this review, though. And then I was like, oh, wait a second. It was Play Anywhere. Let me go download it to the computer. And um, I would argue that it does play a bit better with a mouse and keyboard than it does with the controller. Yeah, um, it's it's meant for mouse and keyboard. So it, it was it was it's not to the point that you can't play it with the controller, but you're gonna notice if you play it with a mouse, be like, you know, that's considerably easier. <laughs> yeah. Um. There are there are a couple of chase scenes that you have to go through to kind of break up the point and clickness, and those with a keyboard are so much easier um 
But it was, it was, it wasn't impossible. It's just that the reaction with a controller is quite not quite the same. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I, I just, I fucking loved it. It was so ridiculously funny, and it, it was just full of charm. The art style is so quirky and surreal. I don't know why anybody's still listening to me talking about it and not just playing it right now. Well, then, do I even need to ask your verdict? No, you're going to go fucking buy this is what you're going to (laughs) do. I want that to be a box quote. It's like, you're going (laughs) to fucking buy this. You can uh, single that line out when you email them a box of review. (laughs) You can even include it in the tweet. Get make Jacob do it. <laughs> <laughs> Cole says you're gonna fucking buy this. Yes, Jacob does our buy. dirty work. <laughs> <laughs> Carnage, higher rating than buy it. Better get, better got fucking buy this. Better look now. I know I talk bad, but I talk better than that. Come you be- on, <laughs> you better got fucking buy this. Type <laughs> typo for the win. <laughs> Oh, my God. Anyway, next game to talk about is called Legend of the Tetrarchs, developed by Hit Point, published by Chemco, released May 8th on Xbox One and Windows 10 for $14.99. The holy sword that sealed away an ominous power had been drawn out and darkness starts to spill across the land, mutating people into monsters. The four Tetrarch heroes of the ancient times will meet a brand new brave warriors to slash through the darkness with the light of courage. Courage. What will they find beyond the chaos? Cole, tell us about it. Uh, they're going to find... I can't tell you that. That's a spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> you almost tricked me. Hey, I'm just reading. <laughs> oh, rude. Um, <laughs> tell us about Legend of the Tetrarchs. <laughs> so this is uh, another top-down RPG. If you've played any Kimco and Hit Point RPG at this point, it's Artifacts Monday. <laughs> and uh, of of the RPGs, and you just know what you're getting. Yeah. Um. And this one isn't any different. It doesn't disappoint. I will say that of all the ones of these that I've played, uh, this is the better one. Really. And I think it boils down to it has better pixel art for starters. Um, and that makes a big difference. <laughs> and it does still have that that pixel art you know, gameplay. And then like when there's a dialogue, it comes up and has the manga style um, characters over top of the, or, you know, beside the text or whatever. Yeah. But I just think the, the pixel art in general, it just has a better color scheme. It's, it's a little nicer done. It seems like there's a little more attention to detail. It just generally looks better. Um, gameplay wise, a lot of the fat has kind of been stripped out of this one. Um, there aren't any, um, that, that currency, I can't even remember what it was called in the other one that you earn, where like you, you could earn the currency and then you could go and play those slot type games. And basically it was a a microtransaction money pit, a play to win thing, pay to win, (laughs) play to win, (laughs) play to win is kind of the goal of most games. Yeah, pretty much. Pay, Pay to win is the shitty side of that. And, um. That was kind of something that a lot of these mobile to Xbox ports kind of suffered from was leaving that aspect in. Um, and this one, it was just, it was far more streamlined and a lot of that shit was just kind of stripped out of it. Um, and I wasn't mad about that at all. <laughs> I think there were still a couple of micro tracks. I think you could buy like an XP booster or something like that, but yeah, I think it they was have XP booster, damage booster and no encounters. Yeah. But the, the increase like the the extra currency for better gear and shit like that that one there and that's why i was far more relieved because it felt like my progression in the game was more tied to what i did instead of what you had what i had Mm -hmm. you know had luck been on my side when i'd used up my currency or was i just shit out of luck um so it was it was Far more to my liking that those kind of consumables and the microtransactions had been had been wiped out. Um, combat felt a little cleaner, especially given that it it wasn't trying to like flip to some weird 3D screen <laughs> like some of the other ones had done. Um, it was just a nicer looking combat system. 
there again it was just attack or spell or item and it had been just streamlined and it was far more agreeable for somebody like me who doesn't want to focus on all the dirty micromanaging stuff when it comes to an RPG. Um, it also had an auto battle, which was nice. <laughs> yeah, I know a lot of the Kemco point, games have auto battles. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't really used it as much in the other games because I always felt like I was at too big of a risk of getting fucked. Um, but this one, it, because I could feel more confident in how I'd progressed, I used it a little more often. I was like, yeah, I can, I can let it deal with this one on its own. <laughs> um, the the story in this one is really fleshed out. It's really interesting, but it's also really overwhelming. It's in kind of way? a double-edged sword. I think my first four hours of the game was about three hours of dialogue. Wow. And I just, I just sat <laughs> for so long. And I'm like, I get it. Every little thing is hyper-explained. Nothing can just be, hey, we've got to go get this sword. It's just like, we've got to do this because 700 years ago, somebody did that. And it's like, I <laughs> just let me do the thing. Just, just let me go smash somebody. Okay. That's all I need to do. Swing a sword. Move the fuck on. <laughs> and and I, I can appreciate a, a good story, you know, and I can appreciate the, hey, they made it. You can hold the button and press it a whole bunch and make it go a little faster can't skip it completely though and it's just like you're committed <laughs> you're committed to the fucking cutscenes, <laughs> whether you like it or not and it was it was just kind of frustrating to lose that much time um i remember when i was doing some research on this and i didn't finish it but some other people were saying that it was about a 20 to 30 hour completion <laughs> That's pretty good. And I, I, all my time has been spent with cutscenes. <laughs> 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 and it's, it's just less talky, less talky, more slashy. Okay. And that's basically my, my biggest complaint. Um, there are 10 characters. They're all kind of generic. And, and I think that was another hit to like, all of the dialogue was like, you're all talking so much, but you're all just basically interchangeable. There wasn't enough between the characters to set them apart, to be like, Oh yeah, I need to be, you know, interested in this character's arc or that character. I was like, okay, but what makes that any different than the five other guys? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And so it was, uh, it was a little disappointing that for all of that build up. You could have stuck any Tom, Dick, or Harry in the story, and it would have been the same. <laughs> um, one thing that I did like, too, speaking of how they, they claim with the battles, everybody in your party leveled up after a battle. They all gained experience, regardless of whether or not you used them. Oh, thank God. I oh, That makes everything a million times better. Yeah, And I does. get so mad when that's not a thing. Because it's like, no, motherfucker, I don't have... Two million years to sit here and individually level up seventy-two people. <laughs> yeah, that's good that they do that. So it's it's nice when you know you go into a fight. You have a party size of around ten-ish or so at the end. I think it is, and then only four can fight with you at a time. So if you were only leveling up those four, that would be brutal <laughs> because you'd have to listen to so much more dialogue. Yeah, old RPGs were like that, though, where you had to have them in your party to level up. So that's a modern I convenience. Know. Yeah, I'm not mad about that modern convenience. I'm I'm happy. They can get rid of the microtransaction convenience and give us more everybody levels up convenience. <laughs> I'm fine with that. But yeah, anyway, that's that's basically my my complaint and, and everything else. I was really glad to see that it was... Um, more manageable, kind of more suitable as an entry level game for for this 
from these developers because usually they have so much focus on, you know, um, synergies and infusions and whatever term they've decided to use for that, that particular story. And while there, there are, there is that aspect, everything else is just kind of streamlined to the point that even if you don't bother with it, you're still going to kick ass and carry on. Which is good. Yeah. I sometimes, Sometimes you want to play this shit and you just want to get into fights and kick ass and move and go. And, you know, if you can get past the dialogue, <laughs> then that's exactly what you're going to get out of the actual gameplay. Well, then 15 bucks on it. What do you think? I do give this one a try it. It's it's certainly far better than some of the other Kimco and Hit Point games that we've seen. And they're they're moving along. On the right direction. <laughs> I don't know how many hit point games we've gotten because they have hit point and they have X create. So there, there's been a couple of them because the hit point ones have those poncho enemies in them. And I know we've uh, even mm. the last one I did had poncho in it. Yeah, I did right. my research. I know this <laughs> that that's apparently like a signature character for hit point. Nice enemy. Yeah. All right. Well, next game to talk about is called Woodle Tree Adventures Deluxe, developed by Fabio Ferrara, published by Chubby Pixel, released May 8th on Xbox One for $4.99. Woodle Tree Adventures is an old school platform game with a catchy and unique art style. Explore a total of six worlds and save the lands with the magical water drops you'll find throughout your journey, bringing peace back and balance and finally becoming the new hero. Cole, tell us about Woodle Tree Adventures Deluxe. I would like to. What the fuck is this game? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mean that in a bad way. Either. It's just, it's another kind of odd one. Um, you're a, a little tiny stump of wood, and your goal is to find fairy tears to fix the world. So this is a, a platformer. There's no puzzles or anything in that regard. Um, it's surprisingly super easy gameplay wise. It's got a few <laughs> Cole's review. What the fuck is this? It's true though. Uh, I seem to be saying that a lot tonight too. <laughs> <laughs> it's such an odd game because the, the story around it is kind of just kind of convoluted and kind of generic. It's just like, well, we, the, we need to save the world. Here I made you go do that. <laughs> yeah, it's the the story isn't anything special in the game. It's more about the gameplay and it's it's basically a collectathon. You Yeah. go into a level, you collect as many berries as you can, you collect the three uh mer what are they fairy tears? Fairy tears. I was going to call them mermaid tears. No. Close, I guess. <laughs> No. <laughs> you, you collect the three fairy tears and you exit the stage. Uh, rinse and repeat through the, th the six worlds and you beat the game. It's yeah. it's really not that complex. It's fairly simple, fairly straightforward. Uh, it does have some issues, though. The camera. Yeah. I hated the camera in this game. Some of the time it works fine. It gives you a good view. Most lot, of the time, it does not. A lot of times, I found myself wishing I could move the camera up, down, left, right, anything, just now so you I can, can... You can zoom in. You can zoom in, and you can zoom out. And, that's and it, it doesn't help you at all. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't. And there will be times where you think, okay, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that these two blocks are close together, and I can jump, and then you just go falling. Yeah. So, the on the plus side, it's incredibly forgiving. You don't yeah, lose the berries you collected. You don't lose the fairy tears you collected. There's three in each level for the fairy tears. And then there's shit tons of berries everywhere. But, excuse me. Um, you, you don't lose any lives. It's not timed. It's just... It's very relaxing and just take it at your own pace. Yep. Which is so, good. So, I did have one major complaint. And that's, there's, there's no sensitivity option for movement and I felt like I was just slogging through mud. The character moves incredibly slow, even when he's running. I was gonna <laughs> say, you know there's a run button, right? I did know there was a okay. run button. And even still I was just like, I have wrist fatigue. <laughs> 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 this this is an easy game. And there's a lot of people that are gonna be fine with that, but for somebody like me who does have problems with hand fatigue, then having that stiffer character 
and not having any kind of sensitivity option over that, it, it w- kind of became a chore to move them around and I would have to stop and take breaks. Um, so it was, it took me a little longer. Like everybody's like, Oh, this is a quick completion. You could do it in like half an hour to an hour. And I'm like, mm. no, you can't. No, it's, I, I it's need not time. at all that quick. You need a couple <laughs> hours to do this. I was going to say it's a, it's a fairly quick and easy, maybe two hour or so 900. Mm. But the final achievement in the game is to collect 3000 berries. That's the last one I need. I yeah, that's through, the last one I need, but I feel like I did the other ones in a, in about an hour. An hour, hour well, and a half, mean, two hours. It depends I, on... I had to obviously stop, and I spread it out over two days so that I could rest, because the, the hand fatigue was a real issue. Yeah, I made, um, I I made sure to explore lot, everything but... and collect all the berries in every stage. Yeah. But I went through all the six stages. I went through level one a second time, and I went through the two bonus stages... And I only had fourteen hundred berries, so you would have to. So you would have to complete the game through twice, plus yeah. some, to actually get that final achievement. And that's, I I hate when games try to artificially inflate their playtime by having achievements like that. I would have rather seen the last achievement be fifteen hundred and completed it in two hours than you know spend four hours playing it and yeah. get. You know, that 3000 berry achievement, it's, it's just not worth it in my eyes. It's a fun game, but it's, you know, I played it. I did everything. I played all the stages. I collected all the berries. I don't want to have to just slog through the stages over and over and over and over again to collect 1500 more berries. Right. I feel better hearing you say that because that's, I felt the same way, but I always worry that I'm a little, um, hard. On games when it comes to forced replay like that because it is hard for me to no. to sit and do that um and especially again when when it is making my hands hurt to start with no. then it's just like i i i've had to genuinely sit and consider do i really want that last achievement that bad no. um and, and that's I'm, a shame i'm fine staying at 900 honestly i'm i'm good at having a 900 out of a thousand achievements this is one of those, like, I loaded it up this morning and played while I was waiting for the girls to get ready for school, and I just collected a couple of berries. I think I'm around 1,800 now, <laughs> but I just played for a little bit, and then I shut it off, and I haven't touched it for the rest of the day, and I may continue to do that over the course of a week or so until I get them all. There you go. Just don't feel any overwhelming urge to break my neck at it. No. Um because it is, it, it is arbitrary and kind of forced. And it was when, when I was playing through it and I crossed that 1000 threshold, I thought, oh, getting 3000 isn't going to be that bad. Cause I still was only like, I think I still had the two bonus levels to go. And then I did those and then it pops and it's like, oh, you have 1600. And I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> 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 but what's there is it's there. it's a fun enjoyable game it's nothing that you're gonna write home about and extol the virtues on top of the rooftops but it's it's fun it's entertaining it's a good two-hour distraction yeah and the important thing is that this is a five dollar game this isn't trying to be mario odyssey this isn't trying to be even like a hat in time this yeah. is just trying to be acute, straightforward, good for younger audiences. And I think for the five bucks, it's, it's fuck it. Why not? Just, yeah. It's five bucks. Yeah. I can, I can definitely agree with that. Um, even number three was like, Oh, can we play this this weekend? And I was like, I don't care. Go for it. <laughs> it's a, Cause <laughs> it's, it's plenty suitable for kids. It's easy enough that that kid can play super meat boy. She's going to blow through that in no time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even a little worried about her playing through it. So yeah, yeah, I agree. Fuck it, why not? See, that's why we have that rating. It's a good one. It is, and that's something you could put on your box quote too. Fuck it, why not? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's an E-rated game. Should we put that on our trailer? <laughs> <laughs> eh, fuck it, why not? <laughs> Anyway, final game to talk about tonight is called Brief Battles, developed and published by Juicy Cupcake, which is an amazing name. Yeah. 
released May 7th on Xbox One for $14.99. May your butt reign supreme. Brief Battles brings bottom-up action to your screen and a party game with a cheeky twist. It's all about the undies. Scramble to grab super-powered undies to embrace the power of the butt and gain an underwear-fueled edge over your friends as you strive to prove who has the mightiest buns. Uh, Carnage would love all the puns there. Oh my gosh, this is so many puns in this game. Buns Tell us about and the game. Puns, for buns and puns. Days. <laughs> buns I'm not and puns. Oh my god, that's convinced. the name of the show. That's the name of the episode. <laughs> buns and puns. I'm not entirely convinced that this game wouldn't get you banned on Twitch. <laughs> it is all about butts. <laughs> but <laughs> it's it's absolutely hilarious. It really is. So brief battle. What are you doing the game? Uh, we should I'm start there. there. Calm down. Okay, do, do, do. I'm trying buns, to keep the show Joe. flowing, goddammit. Hold, hold on to your buns, <laughs> Joe. <laughs> Don't get your knickers in a knot. <laughs> hey, you can't say that on the show. <laughs> what, underwear? No, never mind. <laughs> I was a little worried that might have come out sounding so like something that it shouldn't have after I said it. I was like, fucking redneck. <laughs> God damn it. Yeehaw. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, just wait. I got a better one for later. You can <laughs> hold on to your pants. It's coming. I'm, I'm prepared. All right. So, Brief Battles is a local multiplayer party game that pits you and three of your nearest and dearest against each other in an epic battle for your bloomers. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> With classic battle mode, each app has purple, white, or orange presents that'll pop up randomly. And then you'll have up to four players and trying to collect those presents. And the white ones will give you health. The orange ones can either give you something helpful or be a trap. And the purple ones give you bloomers. And the bloomers have magic special underwear <laughs> abilities. And this is where I talk about this game is weird. <laughs> <laughs> I love games that you can only describe while laughing. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> so f- there are uh ice undies, for example, that will let you shoot uh frost ice, little ice orbs. Um there are flame and hot undies that will <laughs> let you shoot orbs of fire. Toasted There's- buns. Yeah, there's cheetah undies, or leopard, it's leopard, and it will um, make you move faster. <laughs> oh, God. They they all have their own special um, ability. Buns of Steel is one, and it gives you a little extra defense and lets you kind of do a charge attack. Oh, they're so ridiculous, and there are so many possibilities for what you can do. Um, Gameplay-wise, it's, it's super easy to play this game. There's only a handful of buttons that you even need to deal with at all. You can press A to jump, press Y to super jump. Um, If you super jump, you can do a double single, a double single, a double regular jump after that while you're still in the air. But if you do a regular jump, you cannot do a super jump after that. So you have to do Uh. the super jump from the ground. That is your one big hitch. That's your biggest thing to remember. Um, A handful of butt Buns. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> why didn't we bring Carnage off for this? One? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I lost my place. <laughs> um, you do the super jump, and then you also have the ability to. I think it's X. Like, yeah, it's X. It does your uh, underwear ability. And that, that changes depending on which underwear you get out of the purple boxes. Um, in classic mode, it's, it's a good old fashioned free for all deathmatch. Um, every man for himself, kill everybody as much as you can in the time allotted for as many rounds as you set up and call it a day. Whoever wins, wins. There is also, um, <laughs> hold the gold. In which um, gold bloomers will spawn, and whoever has them has a countdown timer, and whoever um, doesn't have them needs to try to kill whoever's got the gold underwear <laughs> and try to take it from them. Whoever reaches the max on the the countdown timer wins. Um, 
again, it's it's all broken down into rounds. So if you don't win the first round, you could still try to come back and fuck up your buddies and, and get it the next time. There's also Underpants Collector, which was my favorite mode, um, where literally just underwear spawns all over the map. And it, it doesn't give you any special ability. There will be purple boxes with special underwear in them that you can get, but the, this is just collect as many tidy whities as you can. Nice. Um, a portal will spawn somewhere on the map, and then you have to go through the portal before time ends in order to lock down your underwear count. <laughs> Oh, if you are Lord. killed, then you drop all the underwear you were holding. Whoever killed you or whoever's nearby has the opportunity to pick that up. But again, you respawn, you kill them, you take it back from them. It's fantastic. Uh, David was very mad when he killed me and picked up, I think, like eight or nine underwear off of me. Oh, God. <laughs> and then I respawned. And the best part about this game is tricking people to kill themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and so like I knew if I hung on to the wall that David was going to try to butt smash me if I stayed there long enough and he went to do the jump to butt smash and I immediately leaped off the wall and went toward the side and he just <laughs> and fell onto the spiky thorns below <laughs> Oh boy! And he was so mad at me. I might be divorced now. I don't know. <laughs> he was getting so fed up with the shit that I was doing to him in this game. There was um, I would actively um, uh, like set off the traps so that when he would try to butt smash me, the traps would get away, and I'd <laughs> jump out of the way and just fall. I was horrible. I was a horrible oh, hero. Oh, you're such an ass. And it was hilarious. He he didn't like being the butt of the joke for the game. <laughs> <laughs> Tee hee. Giggle. <laughs> for, for as much fun as the multiplayer is, too. Usually when there is um, a multiplayer aspect that is so heavily the the focus of a game like this. There's not a lot to do if you're a single player. But this this actually has an, an entire single player segment. It's more set up to be like training, but they get progressively more difficult. Some of them can even be done with a co-op partner because they get fucking hard. Um it, it can be as simple as like setting up targets or um, having to collect all of the underwear on the map in, in a set amount of time. They just get gradually more difficult. Sometimes it'll even throw in extra obstacles. Um, at one point, it had ghosts that were stealing the underwear from me. Fuck those guys. Oh, God. <laughs> so these, these um, it, it is a, a fully fleshed out additional mode. And I think there's... I'm not even going to try to guess. I should have counted how many levels there actually were before I started, but I didn't because I had a busy week. Because how many reviews did I do this week? Seven? Oh, six. Six? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> it's Sorry. It's been a, a crazy week. Sorry that I forgot to load up the game and see how many levels there actually were for the single player part. But there were a lot. I know that I cleared out... Um, cleared out like six rows and there were still more to go so so there's a lot of content basically. yeah you're not you're not going to run short of things to do even if you're in a position where you don't have somebody else to play it with you but if you do have people to play it with you oh you're gonna make them hate you <laughs> no buts about it no buts about it hold on to your bloomers <laughs> <laughs> oh my god so overall brief battles 15 bucks what do you say it's worth it. I the Carnage to say there's no online and there's not. I really wish there were. Um, but even as it is, I still say that it's worth it. It was a lot of fun. You know what? That's a review I could get behind. <laughs> I'm an no asshole. But, <laughs> no, no buts about it. <laughs> I'm an asshole. <laughs> and Arth wipe. Yes, Arth wipe. <laughs> Mr. Arthwipe. <laughs> it's been a good week for games. It really has. Some weeks are harder than others, but this one, this was a good one. Like when I can't pick specifically one game to nail down and say what was my favorite, that's that's a good week. Well, my pick of the week is Final Fantasy XII, obviously. I don't, I don't even think anybody had to ask. 
ask. <laughs> no, but I was going to say it anyway. <laughs> Can you pick between Fade to Silence and Bertram Fiddle, or are you just, like, stuck in the middle with them? You know, I I think it's because they both... They're so drastically big. different. Yeah, and they tickle, like, the extreme sides of my, my gaming preferences. One's a... a stupid ridiculous point and click and the other is stupidly hard roguelike and they're so far apart but they both did what they they were setting out to do so well that i was like i i don't feel like a minute play spent with playing either one of them was wasted awesome yeah well maybe the two hours when my game glitched but (laughs) aside (laughs) from that (laughs) oh boy Yeah, good good episode, though. A lot of good games. I'm happy with this episode. Yeah, it was a pretty solid episode. A lot of good news, a lot of good games. Uh, we're going to wind things up with some good music as well. Last episode, we played some songs from Eric W.K. off of his motherfucking Earthbound album. And we're going to play some more motherfucking Earthbound on this episode as well. Are you going to puke in a bucket after you stop recording? Probably, because I've felt like shit for the past half hour. So Your face looks a little red. <laughs> <laughs> you look I'm glad you okay. can notice. Yeah. All right. Well, that is it for this episode. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Cole, do you have any final words to wrap it up? Uh, I'd like to make some kind of fantastic fun, but I've already used up all the ones I had. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> Earthquake. <laughs>